Let's take our Bibles, please. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 13 this morning. Matthew chapter 13. There are two parables that Jesus told that have one meaning. We're going to look at both parables this morning. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's a story Jesus told, something that was true to life, uh, to teach us some truth, to teach us some uh, point, some uh, principle of Scripture. The title of the message this morning is this, A Treasure worth dying for, a treasure worth dying for. It is Memorial Day weekend, and this weekend I think it's appropriate for us to remember those who have paid the ultimate price. Um, When you speak to folks who've fought in war, um, none of them feel like they're heroes. They just tell you, no, we were there doing our job. We were there fighting for the next man, for the person next to us. Uh, We were there fighting for our families, but the truth is um, they are heroes. They gave of themselves. They sacrificed. They uh, left home and went to a foreign land and knew what the ultimate price might be, and they paid that price. And uh, so they viewed America as a treasure worth dying for. Well, here in Matthew 13, we find a treasure worth dying for. Look at Matthew 13, verse 44. The Bible says, Jesus telling this parable says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts through your word. Help us, Lord, to understand a little bit how valuable we as sinners are to you. Help us to understand just a little bit of your great love for us. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you'll use this frail tongue, Lord, to say the things you want said the way you want them said. And if there be someone here that is lost, Lord, may they trust you as Savior today. We'll thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. A treasure worth dying for. Two parables, one meeting. I hear a little bit of a ring in this here, brother. I don't know what to do about it. I just hear a ring. Um, The first parable, there's a man who, if you notice verse 44, he finds a treasure. He's in a field. And in that field, no doubt, there's some weeds and some skunks and possums and maybe some garbage, some rocks, some thorns, some mud. There's also in that, tre- in that field a treasure. And the man finds the treasure and it's so valuable to him that he is literally willing to sell everything. I mean, stop and think about that for a minute. Imagine you are willing to sell everything you own just to have that one treasure. Well, that's what this man does in this parable. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like that. It's like... A treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Then he gives another parable. He says again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, a man who sells, buys and sells pearls. And he's seeking goodly pearls, so he travels far and wide to find the best pearls there are to offer. But he comes across one pearl one day, one pearl pearl. That one pearl is so valuable to him. That one pearl matters so much to him that he sells all the other pearls and everything else he owns, he sells it all just to buy one pearl. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like both of those stories. These parables have been interpreted many ways, but I want to help us understand when he speaks of a kingdom of heaven, he's not speaking of land. He's not speaking of geographical boundaries. When he's speaking of the kingdom of heaven, I'll tell you what he's speaking of. He's speaking of souls, people, 
men and women, boys and girls, whose souls will die and go forever, either to heaven or to hell. You know what God wants? He wants you in the kingdom of heaven. He wants you to be born again. He wants you to be saved. He wants your sins to be forgiven. So when he's speaking of this kingdom, he's speaking of you. He's speaking of me. Let me remind you what the Bible says in the book of Luke. It says that there's more joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. More than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Again, there are two parables here, but there's one meeting. I want you to see, first of all, the man. In verse 44, it's a man who's found a treasure. And in verse 45, it's a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. But the man is the same. Number one, the man in this story is the God-man, Jesus Christ. He's not just a man. He's God in the flesh. And the Bible says in Luke 19.10 that the Son of Man, and by the way, that was Jesus' favorite title for himself, the Son of Man. Isn't that amazing that God in the flesh would so want to identify with us that his favorite title for himself was Son of Man. The Son of Man, he says, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Just like the treasure hunter went into the field to find a treasure, just like the man seeking goodly pearls, he sought until he found one that he wanted. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth seeking to save people. John 3.17 says, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Number one is the man. Number two is the treasure. What I want you to notice is that other people didn't see the value in this treasure. Other people saw a field and some garbage and some weeds and some rocks and some mud and a possum and a skunk. But what this man saw was a treasure. He looked past the weeds. He looked past the possum and the skunk and the mud and the thistles and he saw a treasure. He saw something worth giving up everything for. That's what he saw. The merchant man who sought goodly pearls, everybody else just saw another pearl, just another one. But this merchant man saw one, and it was so valuable to him, he was willing to give it all up for that one. The man is Jesus Christ. The, tre the treasure, I'll tell you what the treasure is. The treasure is you. The treasure is me. The treasure is every soul. See, we don't, we, I think we give mental assent to the idea, yeah, God loves me, but do you really understand the depths of how much God loves you? Do you really understand that in your eyes you are a treasure to him? Say, how could I be a treasure? I'm a sinner. Again, I'll, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like that man who found treasure hid in a field. It was hidden. The treasure wasn't seen to everybody else. What everybody else saw was just an old field. What everybody else saw was a bunch of weeds. What everybody else saw was a bunch of thorns and a skunk and a possum and mud. But he saw what was hidden. See, when God looks at you, he sees what's hidden. When, uh, when the world looks at you, they might just see another sinner just like themselves. They might see a drunk or a drug addict or somebody filled with pride or greedy or filled with lust, or filled with envy. They see the weeds, the junk, the garbage, but God sees something deeper. He sees what you can be through Jesus Christ. See, Hebrews 12, 2 says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. And don't miss this. Furthermore, Hebrews 2, it says, He is not ashamed to call them, believers, brethren. For the Son of God to call me a brother, isn't that amazing? It's amazing that I, a child of hell, should in his image shine. That's amazing to me. We see the wickedness in our own hearts. We see the trash, the weeds, the garbage, the road in our two, but he sees the treasure. He sees the treasure. By the way, let me say a word to husbands and wives. There was a time you didn't focus on the weeds and the mud. Husbands and wives, you didn't focus on the weeds and the mud and the rodent and the garbage in the field. You found a treasure. Remember that? 
Remember when you said, I do? Remember when you asked her? Remember when you, you talked to everybody about the one you found? What happened? You can say that louder, brother. It's okay. <laughs> uh, if you're not careful, you know what happened? You, you took your eyes off the treasure. You noticed the weeds. And somehow you think that there's a field at work that doesn't have weeds. You follow what I'm saying? Or do I need to be a little more plain? <laughs> somehow you think the neighbor up the street doesn't have any garbage in their yard. They don't have any rodents. Somehow you think everybody else's Facebook marriage is perfect. And you believe it. You know, Facebook, that's, that's personal marketing is what that is. You know, what are you going to tell? Dude, yeah, he left his socks on the floor again. You know, are you going to put that on Facebook? Don't do it. Please don't do it. We don't want to see that. But, but you get what I'm saying. You, you took your eyes off the treasure. And you started focusing on the, the struggle. This happens again. You know, our nation certainly, certainly has many problems, but can you think of a nation you'd rather live in? Can you? I, I can't think of one. Here on this earth, I can't think of one. We have a treasure in our nation. We, we have freedom that's just unheard of in centuries. I, I'm afraid that we don't appreciate it. You know, too often we have to lose something before we appreciate it. What about the treasure of your Bible? Has there been a time in your Christian life where you just couldn't wait to hear the Word of God preached or taught or you just couldn't wait to dive in again? Find a new nugget of truth? But somehow it lost its luster to you? Somehow the stuff of the world began to appeal to you? You found a church where people loved the Lord and loved you and the word of God was preached, but then you realized the church was full of normal people too who have struggles and troubles. A little bit of weeds, a little bit of garbage. What I'm saying is if you're not careful, the treasures in your life, you'll start to ignore those treasures and you'll start to focus on the weeds and the struggles. But this man, he had the right vision Who's the man in this story? It's Jesus Christ. He said the kingdom of heaven is like this man where treasure was hid in a field. Nobody else could see the treasure, but he could see it. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking, looking for goodly pearls. He found one pearl of great price. It was so valuable to him. He was willing to lay it all aside to get that one. The man in this story is Jesus Christ. The treasure in this story is you. Look at Ephesians 2. Again, I know we give mental assent to, yeah, God loves me, but we don't really understand it. We, we don't really, we, we really haven't plumbed the depths of what that means. That God, our creator, loved us enough, even after we sinned, even after we rebelled against him, he loved us enough to send his only begotten son when we were enemies of God. He sent his only begotten son here to take our place on an old rugged cross. I don't I can't think of a friend I would give my children for, let alone an enemy. We were enemies of God in our sin, and he gave his only begotten son for us. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 1. It says, And you hath he quickened, he's made you alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy... You know what mercy is? God not giving me the judgment I deserve. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, we had nothing to offer God. Nothing. 
Only he could see the treasure. Everybody else sees the field. We were dead in sins, but he still loved us. When we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Here's another great word, by grace. Ye are saved. What's grace? God giving me favor I don't deserve. So not only does he love me, not only did he give me mercy where he doesn't give me the judgment I deserve, but he gives me grace. He gives me favor I don't deserve. It'd be enough if God said, I'm going to send my only begotten son in your place to die on the cross and he'll die for you. He'll suffer as no man ever has. He'll be buried. He'll rise again. So you don't have to go to hell. That would be enough. And God would be an amazing God. But he said, not only am I giving you mercy, I'm giving you grace. I'm not going to just not give you the judgment you deserve, but I'm going to give you everything that my son deserves. Do you understand that? That's grace. What Jesus has earned, I'm giving it to you. Your joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Great love. Great love. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. He would have been a great God if he said, I'll give you grace as long as you live here. I'll give you a life here. You're forgiven. I'll give you grace and then you die and that's it. But no, he said he's raised us up together. In the ages to come, he's going to show us the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness. For eternity, I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Your works don't impress the holy God. Only His, the work of his only begotten son on the cross can impress a holy God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. If our salvation had anything to do with our works, we would brag about it. We'd get to heaven and say, yeah, Jesus did his part, but I did mine. Do you understand? There's nothing we could do to impress a holy God. We're sinners. At our best, we deserve hell. That's what we deserve, but Jesus took our place. The man in this story is Jesus Christ. In Matthew 13, the treasure in both stories is you, souls. Number three, the price. I want you to see the price in both stories. It cost him all that he had. If you were God, would you give all you had for you, for the sinners in this world? Would you? That's what God did. The price, all that he had. He found a treasure in a field, and he selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. The merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Folks, Jesus gave all that he had, so we could be saved. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Look at 1 Peter 2, please. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. Jesus literally gave it all. He literally gave the clothes he wore. See pictures which cannot do it justice, the crucifixion, but see pictures of Jesus hanging there with some little loincloth. Folks, he was naked and shamed on that cross, bearing the sins of all mankind. Even his cloak, while he was there hanging on the cross, suffering in our place, the soldiers gambled for it. He gave it all. When a soldier took a spear and put it up into his heart, into his lungs, he gave his last drop of blood. Blood and water came out. He gave it all. He held nothing back so that we might be saved. Nothing. 
1 Peter 2, 21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. When Jesus hung on that cross, he took all of my sin, all of your sin, all the guilt, the shame, the pain of our sin, he put it upon himself so that we could have his righteousness. The price, all that he had. Number four, last of all, the possession. The possession in both of these stories, Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, 44, the possession in the first story is a treasure that's hidden in a field. You are the treasure. In the story in Matthew 13, 45, the possession is a pearl, one pearl of great price. You are that one pearl of great price to God. Say, God thinks of me that way. Psalm 139 says, His thoughts towards us are more than the sand by the seaside. The hairs of your head are all numbered. Not one sparrow falls to the ground without your heavenly Father. How much more valuable are you than a sparrow? So number four, the possession in both of these stories, again, the possession is us. We are the possession. What does that mean? We belong to Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means he's in charge. He calls the shots. You know, if some man owned your life, they'd manipulate your life for their own benefit. But the God-man, Jesus Christ, we belong to him. Everything he tells us to do is always for our benefit. 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, What know ye not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. Listen to this part. And ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Well, this is what I like to do. You don't belong to yourself anymore. Child of God. This is the way I like to talk. You don't belong to yourself anymore. This is where I like to go. The entertainment I like. You don't belong to yourself anymore. Who do you belong to? The Lord Jesus Christ. You're bought with a price. The possession, we belong to him. The man is Jesus Christ. The treasure is you. Others may not see the value in any of us, but God does. He sees the value in you. He sees you just like Jesus Christ. That's what he's going to do. He's going to make us like Jesus Christ. He paid a price. What was the price he paid? All that he had. He shed his blood on the old rugged cross. He literally even gave his clothes and every drop of blood, and he took our shame and our pain and our sins upon our, himself. Amen. Is it too much for him to ask us to serve him? Is it too much for him to have the say-so in our lives? We're not our own. We're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I have time. I might as well park here a little bit. It's Memorial Day weekend. I know it's kind of cold. But some people will lose their minds over Memorial Day weekend. I'm talking about even Christians. Are your steel toe boots on now? I try to give warnings. Some of you are going to go out this weekend. I hope not. I hope, I hope this will change your mind. And you're going to throw on underwear. <gasps> I said it in church colored pink and purple and blue buy a bunch of water with sand under your feet and suddenly it's okay. 
See if you can get any more quiet. Hold on. Hold on. So, boy, you, you are extreme. Hold, hold, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. That's what we've always done. Who's your life belong to now? I mean, is this just stuff we just say, or do we really mean that? I mean, in church, we'll say this religious stuff. We belong to Jesus. We belong to Jesus. Oh, now let's go do what we want outside those doors. Now, see, outside those doors is where the world needs to see you belong to Jesus. Outside those doors is where you need to see, hey, I'm bought with a price because I'm bought with a price. I'm going to glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's. My body, the things others see, my spirit, the part nobody else sees but God. Now, by the way, that does come out in your attitudes. It does. But we need to glorify God in every area of our lives. Well, this is old-fashioned. No, this is Bible. I, I can take the Bible and show you God's. Hey, look, everybody has standards. Everybody has standards. The key is what is God's standard? What's God's standard for nudity and modesty and decency? What's God's standard? God's standard is don't show your thighs. God's standard was Adam and Eve said, hey, let, let's put on some little fig leaves and cover ourselves. God said, I'm going to make you coats to cover you. Coats. See, this makes for fun preaching in here, but what about out there? Glorify God. Glorify God. So does it, you know, I'll tell you the story of Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright, how many of you have heard of Peter Cartwright? He was an evangelist, a circuit riding preacher, rode through this area, Kentucky, I think Ohio, Indiana, maybe this whole, this region anyway. Uh, they said about Peter Cartwright, he was an evangelist, big man. He had a voice uh, that would make women cry and strong men tremble. That's what they said, you know. <laughs> he was a pistol packing preacher, by the way. He'd carry that around. He was in some rough, rough neck towns. Back then, Kentucky was the West. This, this was the Wild West, okay? And uh, there, there's a story, if you've never heard of this, you should look it up. It's called the Dance Hall Revival. How many of you have ever heard of the Dance Hall Revival? Anybody? Go look it up sometime. Peter Cartwright was staying in a town. Of course, he'd go into a town. He'd preach. He'd give the gospel. He'd challenge people to live for Christ. He was staying above a dance hall. And people were pressuring him, come on, be one of the people, come on, join the dance, join the dance. They shouldn't have asked. He did. He came down to the dance hall. He walked out in the middle of the floor. There was a young lady who'd been trying to get him to do, dance, and he grabbed her hand. And in his voice, he said, Now, before I do anything, I want to ask the Lord's blessing on it. I don't want to do anything that would bring dishonor to him. So I want to ask the Lord's blessing. And he got down in the middle of that dance floor and the girl was trying to pull away and he wouldn't let her go. And he got down on his knees. Heavenly Father started to pray. You know what happened? People started to cry. People started to get right. You know why? They knew what they were doing wasn't right. They knew what they were doing was just giving in to the culture. How many of you think the culture has it right? No, Scripture has it right. God has it right. You won't go astray following, following Scripture. You will go astray following culture. It may not cost you initially, immediately, but it will cost you in the long run to forsake Scripture. Don't do it. There's a possession in this, both these stories. What's the possession? We are. Look, do you think God's going to abuse your life? No. The things He tells you to do and not to do are for your benefit, for your blessing. Proverbs 20, verse 1. I don't think I need to spend much time here, but wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. There's all kinds of preachers peddling that stuff today. Say, well, my preacher said so, then your preacher's not right with God, and your preacher doesn't know what he's talking about. Stay away from the stuff. But I've always enjoyed, is that really the question we should ask anymore? We don't belong to ourselves. But I was raised, but I like, hold it. The question should be, the question should be, and this is what it means, by the way, to seek God's face. This is what it means. 
When the Bible says to seek God's face, it means to look at his face and see if he approves. God, what do you think? That's all that matters, isn't it, Christian? Christian, it's all that matters. We could turn to many places here. I, I want to remind you what Paul said when he was reached with the gospel. He said, now I count all things but dung for Christ Jesus. All the stuff this world has to offer, it's nothing, worse than nothing. I want Jesus. I want his will for my life. I want to please him. Titus 2, look at Titus 2, 11, please. Titus 2, there's, there's a word here. In Titus 2, look at verse 11 uh, through 14. It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, notice this, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Well, you can't live for Christ in this world. He just said we're supposed to. He just said in this present world we're to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. Guess what? We are going to stand before him one day. He is coming again. He is taking charge. He's not going to have a vote. He's not going to ask the Supreme Court what they think. He's going to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. Looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and Purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You know what that word peculiar means? It, different. Not different necessarily in weird, though the world may see it that way, but peculiar as in, a, there's another place in the Bible that talks about that we are a peculiar treasure. You know, a, a, a diamond isn't just like any old rock out there. Right? I mean, you know, why, did, why at your engagement did you want a diamond? It's a rock. Why did you want a diamond as opposed to, and we have plenty of gravel out here. You could have used, you could have saved a lot of money, guys. I mean, really. Why did you want a diamond? Because it's peculiar. It's valuable because it's peculiar. Because you don't just find them everywhere like gravel. It takes thousands of years, perhaps, in, in some instances, to make those diamonds. God said, you are my possession. You are my peculiar treasure. You are valuable to me. And because you are valuable to me, I don't want you just to be like all the gravel in the world. I want you to be what I have saved you to be. I want to purify unto myself a peculiar people. Yes, different from the world. Zealous of good works. I remember when Mary took that alabaster box of ointment. It was worth one year's salary. She broke it over Jesus. Remember that? Broken and spilled out. She washed his feet with her tears, with her hair. And those who didn't love Jesus all that much, what did they say? To what purpose is this waste? Hold on, could you ever waste anything on Jesus Christ? So I'm going to give my life, I get one life, I'm going to give it for Christ. Is that a waste? Hold on, he gave all for you. He owns the right to us. We're bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The man is Jesus Christ, the treasure. Others didn't see the value in us. Others still may not see the value, but God does in you. He sees it. He looks past the weeds, the garbage, the rodents. He sees a treasure that he was worth giving everything for. And he did. 
He came to this earth and suffered as no man ever has to pay the price so we could be saved. And if you're saved, you belong to him. Your life belongs to him. We belong to him. Jesus knew you're a treasure worth dying for. So Christian, I ask you, is Jesus to you a treasure worth living for? Is he worth living for? How valuable is Jesus to you? Let's bow our heads together, please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. It may be that you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior. It might be you're here and the truth is if you died today, you're not 100% sure of heaven. I want to tell you that God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to this earth for you. For me, I'm standing here as a sinner saved by grace, telling you as a sinner who needs a Savior that Jesus is that Savior. Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, lived a perfect sinless life. He suffered in our place on an old rugged cross so we wouldn't have to die and go to hell. He was buried and he rose again. And the Bible says he's able to save to the uttermost the, them that come unto God by him. He'll save you if you'll come to him today. He'll save you. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever, that's you. That was me. I remember trusting Christ as my Savior. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's Jesus, shall be saved. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who would say, Pastor, that's me. I need to be saved. I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I need to be saved. I wish you'd pray for me. At least pray for me. If I could know how to go to heaven, I'd like to know. Please pray for me. Lift your hand if that's you this morning. Lift your hand up, anybody at all. Heads are still bowed. Eyes are still closed. Perhaps you didn't raise your hand, but you know you're not saved. And in a few moments, as the piano plays, I want to encourage you to come to the front. Just leave your seat. Just leave your seat. We want you to come. Come to the front. Someone will take a Bible and show you how to be saved. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. Who would say, Pastor, I am saved. I'm born again. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. I, I'm not a perfect person, but I have a perfect Savior who's paid the full price for me. And I want to thank Him and praise Him. I can't thank Him enough. That's you. Would you lift your hand? Would you thank Him? Would you praise Him? If your hand is raised, you know you're a child of God. My hand is raised with you. What does that mean? We belong to Him. Our lives are not our own. They're bought with a price. He, the price, he gave everything. He gave everything. We owe our lives to him. He, we belong to him. The question in life should no longer be, what makes me happy? What do I want to do? The question should be, Lord, what is your will? What pleases you? Lord, I want to seek your face and do your will. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. My head is bowed, my eyes are closed. Who would say, dear Lord, maybe for the first time or maybe again, I yield myself to you. I know my life doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. And I want to live my life to please you. I want my life to glorify your name. I want to glorify you in my body and in my spirit. They both belong to you. So Lord, I again, or maybe for the first time, I yield myself to you now. If that's you, would you lift your hand to him? You know how many times a day we need to do that? Over and over and over and over again. We tend to forget that we're bought with a price. We tend to forget that our lives don't belong to us. They belong to him. And I want to remind you, if you will yield to him, you'll have the most happy, blessed life you can have. We're always better off when we let him call the shots. We're always better off when we follow our Lord Jesus Christ Heavenly Father thank you for your word bless it to our hearts thank you for your people here this morning may we remember the decisions we've made today Lord I pray if there be someone here that's lost may they trust you now in this invitation in Jesus name we pray Let's